in a Go. bad place here. On Hi, this. this is the Reverend Dottie Boone. I'm sorry. <laughs> and welcome. Uh, we're talking about past lives and the fact that I've taught this class many times before. And what I have realized when I do psychic readings or when I talk to people, everybody has had a past life, a previous incarnation. The thing is that some people have just one, some people don't remember them at all. I met one gentleman who swore he hadn't had a past life, <laughs> and he was so confused. And he'd been in and out of mental institutions many, many times because he didn't have that foundation. A past life might be good or bad, but it's our foundation. It's so kind he literally of like, did not have a past life, he just wasn't? He wasn't grounded at memory. all. There was no basis for him to be here on. He had just kind of came in, and uh, we, we have crazy. newbies. I mean, we don't have everybody who's had a past life. Uh, for me, I've had so many of them, and you're going to be hearing about some of them tonight because every time I do this class, it reminds me of past lives I've had. So if you said, oh, Dottie, I've heard that before, okay, get over it. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about it anyway. I've known you 30-something years, I'm sure. <laughs> there, 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 quite, a, quite a few of them. Uh, but for me, what has been very, very interesting is the fact that other people around me have past lives. When you are, get to the point where you go, oh, I don't know, is, is this one of these things that everybody's had a past life? And then somebody comes up with one and it so, so surprises you. So one of the first ones I want to talk about was my uh, granddaughter. And uh, my granddaughter, Miranda, I had taken care of her since she was four years old. And she is just an incredible woman. And as a little girl, she was amazing. And she had the ability to do all sorts of things. Come on in, Marie. And she um, was constantly go, 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 okay? And I started taking care of her when she was eight months old and I took care of her until she was four. But this one is one of those that uh, was so interesting because she loved to go outside and play with the little boys on the block. And the little boys on the block were from a Chinese family that had moved in and they were, they were like two and four, and she was just barely two, but they treated her like a baby doll. Oh, Miranda this, oh, Miranda that, Miranda, look at me, oh, Miranda. And they bounced around in the front yard, and his mom and, uh, would come over, and we'd talk, and the kids would oh, just have a great time. And so during that period of time, since Miranda was starting to talk a little bit more, every time a helicopter would fly by, she'd yell, go, Beely Bopper, and she'd run into the house. And I'd say, that's a helicopter, and she was just, she was terrified, and I thought she was afraid it was going to fall. And one day, she said, and the helicopter went over, and she was on the couch, and she's walk, walking up and down the couch, and she said, Beely Bopper, Beely Bopper. And I said, yes, it's a helicopter, and she said, Grandma, bang, night night. And I told him she had died from somebody who had been in a helicopter and obviously had gotten shot. Bang, night night. And so I and I and she was just sobbing. And so I just held her and I said, Your grandma's here, you know, and, and talked to her. Well the next day there's a woman from across the street that walks over with a little boy, little Asian boy, and she says, Hi, this is a Johnny. And Miranda's eyes got real big and she goes, No, no, grandma, no, beetle bopper. And I said, Where are you from? And the woman said, We're from Vietnam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was just like clunk, you know, and uh, she said, is your is the little girl okay? I said, oh, she'll, she'll be okay. We'll, we're going to talk about it. But when you think of that having been so recent, and that's why there was this, this, this remembrance that came in. My, my niece, Jeannie, had one that I, it was so funny. The, my, my mother, my, uh, Eleanor, had taken her to uh, Walmart. She had got in a playhouse and it didn't have the tree in the middle of it that the weevils had. So she was off with grandma, she was four, she was going to go get a weevil tree. And they're walking into Walmart and all of a sudden Jeannie goes, Grandma, Grandma. She said, what? She said, book. She must have been a little younger. She could have been about three. And so uh, my mom says, yeah. She, and she says, see? And she says, yeah. And it was a little golden book. And on it was a picture of a, of a teepee and a, a young boy. And, and she said, my mom said, you want that book? And she said, yeah, yeah. 
And so she was all excited and she had it and she was looking through and looking at all the pictures and, and my mom said, well, that's, that's great. Let's read it when we get home. So they got home and she started reading. And uh, uh, Jeannie says, yes, yes, me, Dofus. And my mom says, your name was Joseph? And she goes, yes. And my mom says, you were a big, strong Indian brave? And she goes, no, no. And my mom said, well, you're a little girl. And she goes, Grandma, all the babies were killed. Mm -hmm. My mother called and said, Dottie, what <laughs> happened? And I said, read about Chief Joseph and the Niz Pierce and when they were traveling to flee and, there, and not be the reservation. And King Joseph, or King Joseph, Chief Joseph. And my mom said, really? Is that what, yeah. I said, yeah. She said, I've got another one? I said, yeah, <laughs> mom, you've got another one. Because when I was young, one day I walked up to my mom and said, when are my real mother and father coming back? <laughs> no. And she said, I am your real mother and father. I said, no, because I had a picture of them. And they were, there was like a cameo. It was a, a man and a woman, and they had very dark skin. And my mom never had dark skin. And I just knew that that was my mom and dad never going to come back for me sometime. And she, and she kept trying to prove to me that she was my real mother. And I was not buying them. I was sure that the real one was. So for me, not only did I have a spirit guide that appeared and started talking to me when I was five, but I had this recall of, of past lives. And because of that, I started wanting to talk to people and give talks about you getting in touch with your past life. Now, what do they do for you? Well, one of the things they do is they let you know that you are not just a body, you are a spirit. And spirit lives forever. And so you are going to be doing so many different things. You might have been incarnated in the, here in, in California. You might have been incarnated in China or India. Uh, but you might have been incarnated on another planet. And when you think of that, you kind of go, another planet? But how many of you get interested in UFOs? Oh. How many of you go, I feel that energy. Life, yeah. Well, why do you think you do? It's because you've been there be before. And so when you think of what was it like being on another planet, you start thinking, well, maybe this is a little bit crazy. It's not. Because it doesn't mean this is a progression that the Earth is better than. It just means Earth has different qualities that you felt you wanted to experience. And that's what your previous incarnations are, is experiencing different qualities. One of the things that I am not going to tell you about, but <laughs> I'm going to uh, have you read, is called Kalapaw. This is one of those lives that you go, oh, oh my gosh, and you have it. And it's I behind, don't- It's the last page it, on the- on the Oh, the purple section? Yeah. Purple, yeah. And so, because I want to talk to you, it says, uh, I started this out, I was doing some past life regression with a gentleman named Milt, and I became of uh, the smell. And all of a sudden, I had that smell that was so ghastly. It smelled like urine and sweat and blood and tears. And I, it's like I could smell the fear and I had no idea where this was or where I was, but I know that uh, wherever I was, it was kind of a bad place. And just then, the, I looked around and there was a light at the end of this dark tunnel. And I could see the sun shining and there was a stadium full of people and they were yelling. And I turned around and I could see this lion in a cage. And I picked up a stick and I started poking. And, I, and the, you could tell that the land was very enraged and very hungry. And when it got really vicious, I opened up the gate and it went out to kill Christians in the Colosseum of Rome. And I was dressed like a, a, a Roman centurion. And I was like, oh my God. And I, well, luckily I, I could follow it further to find out where, how did I die? And as I was thinking that, how did I die? All of a sudden, one of the lions came back and swiped and took my left arm off. Oh. And I oh. was put in a place, and it was a weird tent. And I, I remember kind of sweating and in pain, and somebody walked in and said, he's dying. 
Kalapoth is dying. And that's why it's called Kalapoth. And as I'm laying there thinking, I'm dying, and it has to be of sepsis. I, there's, there's, you know, that's what's happening. And my wife came in to say goodbye. And my, fee, and my male lover came in to say goodbye. And my daughter came in to say goodbye. And they all were very hostile. They didn't really like me, but I had power. And you could tell that's the only reason any of them were in my life was mm. from that power. And, and so I, and I can remember going in and out of uh, delirium, and I heard this person said, I said, do you think Caleb Paul would make it? There was a laughter in the voice that said, I sure hope not. And that's, that's the last I remember of that lifetime. Well, what did that lifetime do for me? I mean, why did I have to do that? What it did was when I was being this very evil, mean person, I enjoyed the heck out of it. I can remember this thrill of doing these negative things. And now before, I have never understood. You see a movie and somebody kills someone, they look like they enjoy it. I could never imagine, I'm a pacifist. <laughs> you see why? I'm a pacifist. And, and that's what was going on. I had to go back and see that to understand why in this lifetime, there are some smells that really turn me off. I'm not particularly fond of cats. Uh, you know, there's just these things that go on in my life that are weird. Everybody loves kitty cats. I've just never really bonded with cats. I like dogs, but I never bonded with cats. And when I, when I saw this, I went, whoa, that really means that this is who I was at that time. And any other lifetime I've had coming forward has been more loving and kind and that type of thing in different situations. And so I, when you do a past mm -hmm. life, don't expect it's all going to be roses and laughter and joy and love. It could be that you were not that great. Could, no, you don't necessarily have to be as evil as Calipa was. But I, f I had to research that, as you can imagine, the shock. I had to research it. So I asked my friend, Michael Berry, who was a very, very much of an expert on Roman time. And he said, oh, under the Colosseum is where the prostitutes plied their trade. It's uh, where all of the, anybody who was really homeless lived, it's where all the drug deals were done. And, that, and that's all of those smells I got that was so awful. And what I could identify with is, I couldn't say anything else but evil. And so sometimes, have you ever done that where you've been walking somewhere in a big city and you walk by an alley and you smell something that the, the, uh, you know, the hair on the back of your neck rises up because it's that smell that is that not dirt. positive. And it's just yeah. the dark, bad smell. Yeah. And that's what I have identified that with and that's what I know about. Mm. So when you, when you look at getting in touch with a past life, be prepared about being honest with yourself. Uh, you know, don't say, well, that can't be me. I couldn't have done that, okay? And this, you will notice when I talk, I wipe my nose quite a bit. I just found out why. Because one of my more recent past lives was in the early 1930s. Uh, I, was, I was mentioning earlier, I had three, I have had three lives in the 30s. In the 1930s, and I was, it was Christmas, and I was standing with my mother, hold, and she was holding my hand. So I had to have been four. And my mother's hand had on a black glove, and her skin was dark. Here we go with that dark skin again. And I had a white muff. All of you know what those white furry muffs are. They're like this. And I was, I was and I, but I had my hand here, and my muff was here. And I'm looking, and I'm watching animated Christmas things in the department store window in downtown Los Angeles. And all of a sudden, I said, my nose is cold. And mom, my mom said, put your nose in your muff. It'll warm it up. So I brought my hand down, I put it in, and I can remember thinking, I'm free. And I turned around and ran right in the front of a green car with a silver uh, fender. And that was that lifetime. And I told my mom this story about well, maybe that's the mother I was waiting for to come back. And she said, Dottie, whereabouts in Los Angeles were you? You know, typical mother. And I said, well, I remember in that lifetime you used to take me to the doctor to put shots in my nose because I had sinus. And he had to pack it with cotton. 
And I remember that even now, I was always doing this. It's like I've always felt like I had cotton in my nose in the select one. And you'll see me with a Kleenex trying to get away from it, but it's always that cottony feeling in my nose. And so my, my mom said, well, where was this? And I said, it was a doctor's office and it had an elevator that had a grate that you closed like this, ching, 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 ching. And she goes, okay. And then what happened? I said, he was on the third floor. And um, he, oh, the floor, because I could look at the floor while we were going up in the elevator, and all the floors had little square tiles on them. And then afterwards, you took me to a restaurant that was a teacup upside down, or coffee cup upside down. And she looked at me. She said, Dottie, they tore that restaurant down four years before you were born. I remember because I tore it down when I was, before I was pregnant with you. And what I, restaurant I, was it? It was in Los Angeles, and I don't know, it was an upside down coffee cup. And as I said, my poor mom, making her a believer about what, what this is going mm -hmm. on. So that became one of those things. And I remember, and it was in Los Angeles. So, and then I turned around uh, from that, and I was born in Los Angeles in Culver City. And so that was one of those that was so amazing that to be able to know that, that remember that kind of detail. And I think you remember more detail sometimes when um, it's more, a more recent past life. Uh, and so when you think about that, when kids say, Mama, I remember something, or, you know, Rosalie will say, I remember something, <laughs> listen to what they say. Because what I found out were many things. Well, I found out that this was probably the, the mother I thought was still looking for me, was going to come back for me. I found out that's why I have a really love for people with dark skin. I don't care whether you're from India or Mexico or Africa. I just, and all my life I've tried to get my skin darker, and all my life it hasn't worked. I, I've lived through <laughs> peel, you know, but I just keep thinking that that's where I can, my, I'm supposed to have darker skin. And, and I have this affinity for people who are dark skin. Um, and brown eyes. I mean, there's just that wonderful energy. Here I go, nose. Uh, so when you when you think of th uh, that, of what was going on for me, it explains so much of who I am. And many of us wonder, why do I do this? Why do I have these white desires? Why do I like this food and not like that food? Why do I, why do I love Mexican food? Why do I, you know, all of these things that you wonder when you compare yourself to other people. And that's because you've been having these different, these different lifetimes. Now, the other thing that we have in past lives is a thing called karma. And karma is what, probably one of the most misunderstood because people want to make it scientific and it's not as spiritual. And the, I found that's the most difficult thing for pe people to do is to stay on board spirituality. What is spiritual and what is scientific? You can't measure karma, but you can feel it. You can feel that sense of uh, not only I've been here before, or that I've learned lessons before. I have things that, uh, in here that I talk about, and, uh, in, in that, and I'll tell you what the name of it is. It says, life is one big karmic classroom. And that's one of the handouts that I have, because um, I know that there had to be something, because of when I get regressed, I always have something that I've learned a lesson from. And so, you know, people say, well, I don't think I've ever had a past life. I, I can't remember it. How about riding a bike? How many of you knew how to ride a bike when you were young? Have you tried it now? Quite often you get on the bike and the first thing is you go, now what do I do? <laughs> Before you push a pedal down. But it all comes back, doesn't it? A quick, and there's a very fast recall in remembering how to ride a bicycle. And that's one of the things that karma is like. People keep saying, I don't understand it. You don't have to understand it. You have to be it and know that this is, you might be on the earth to be the worst person around for a while, but that doesn't mean you're going to stay that bad person. That doesn't mean that there's not growth for you. And I think it helps to realize that you've had a lifetime where it was very, very nasty to see the growth that, that comes in, okay? Um, but sometimes they, you feel like, I'm being, I'm being blocked. I, I want to get better. I want to do better. I want to I know how I can better myself. Do it. 
Don't just give it lip service and, and because there are more ways to become more spiritual. Whether your sense of spirituality is learning the Bible or the Bhagavad Gita or, uh, or, or do Hindu uh, Sanskrit, it doesn't make any difference if what you're learning fills that sense of this is my spiritual being. And we each have a spiritual being. That's why so many people look around everywhere. And some people just want to sit in a forest and be one with the trees. And believe it or not, some people even like to go to the desert. And be the, I, I was raised in the desert. I, that's, that was part of my karmic lesson, I think. <laughs> that's something I don't particularly want to do. But think of what unblocks you. Is it meditation? You can pick up loads of books that talk about how to meditate and see what your karmic connection is to light. Is, is the way you do karma is for you to sit in a hot tub and just completely relax with lavender in the water. Think of the ways that you can relax that mind that's going nanny, 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 nanny enough so you can start looking at what the, the karmic energies are in this playground. This is this life is should be happy. If you're not happy, try and figure out. And it's not, and you'll find from all of the past lives you had that being happy is not about how much money you have. Being happy is not about how about how much you weigh. Uh, just look at me. And people, I, I can remember when I was a little kid, and somebody walked up to me and said, "You're sure fat." And I said, isn't it wonderful? And my mother just shook her head and said, I don't know how I raised somebody like that, but I mean, go for it, girl, you know. <laughs> and, and that, that was just, that's me. Instead of saying, oh, well, one of these days I'm going to lose weight. I hear people, someone says, oh, you're fat. And they'll say, well, one of these days I'm going to lose weight. I never say one of these days I'm going to lose weight. I just say, well, thank you. <laughs> I've worked hard on this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is who I am. And I, I can remember when I was in um, junior high, and I had been uh, bailing hay all summer. And I came into a brand new school, and they said, hey, you want to be on our softball team? I said, I don't play softball. I don't even know how. We, I didn't have softball when I was growing up, you know. Uh, we hit things with sticks, but that was about it. And they said, all you have to do is hold the bat, and when the ball comes, hit it. Well, I had been lifting 150 pound bales. The ball came to me, I hit it, they never found it. They never found it. They don't know where that ball went. And I said, now what? <laughs> you know? and, and, and they just lined my head. They didn't ask me to play ball anymore. Uh, and, and, but I wasn't embarrassed. I didn't say, oh, I'm sorry. It was like, <laughs> I, you know, that's pretty stupid that you want me to give me the stick and I hit that ball and now you're upset because you can't find it. You know? um, but <laughs> it was just that attitude that I had of, no, you're not going to make me wrong. And so when I meet people that say, she said, and I said, so? That's who she wants to be. Get over it. You don't have to take on what people say about you, to you, you know? And if it's behind your back, and then she says, well, so-and-so said such and such behind your back, I said, good for them. But they've got a secret, don't you? <sighs> you take that sting right out of it. Yeah, take it out. Why keep it? Why let what you think of me? Remember, what you think of me is none of my business. And but when I look at the past lives that I've had, I can see where I have evolved to that, where I'm not saying, oh, no, you can't say that about me. I'm saying, oh, good, you're talking about me. Um, and it's a, it's a big, big change, OK? Uh, so karma is cause and effect. It works in every, everything that you do. And it's all about what goes around comes around. So if somebody's talking badly about you, it doesn't reflect on you, it reflects on them. I, you know, one, one day somebody said something, I said, you know, is that all you have to talk about? Can we talk about something positive? You didn't want to be around me during the big heyday of the political problems that were going on. Yeah, it, 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 nobody liked what I had to say. And you know, they'd say, well, the so-and-so said such and such. I said, isn't that interesting? Had you ever thought of that before? <sighs> well, they can't say that. And yes, they can. Well, somebody should stop them. No. What well, karma is going to come around? What goes out and then it's going to come around. 
You just don't you have to be the one that's doing the karma. But don't let it tear you down and make you miserable because you can't control it. Do you realize none of you can control another person? Except maybe Rosalie. <laughs> and I bet she's getting so you can't control her every time. <laughs> trying to get her <laughs> An eight month old. <laughs> she has. <laughs> They're just starting. Yeah. I used to tease Brittany, my daughter, um, that she would be sassing me or something. She'd turn around and walk into a wall. I said, See, your guardian angels got back into <laughs> yeah. the like yeah. yeah. It was like instant. Instant karma. Instant karma. That's yeah. what they say. I used to that to my daughter, too. Yeah. yeah. It's coming. <laughs> so, but, and we choose to come back lifetime after lifetime. Just think, you made this choice. Nobody said you had to. And we choose what we feel is going to be the best for us in our next incarnation. It, sometimes it doesn't work. Okay, sometimes it's not for our best good, but from where we are, we feel. I have a lot of little spirits that said, I, ch I chose to be with this woman because she was going through, so through such a difficult time. I wanted to help her. Well, quite often a 16-year-old doesn't need to get pregnant uh, and help be helped. But your spirit feels like you're such a helping spirit, you're going to help her. And quite often that mother-child um, connection gets better and better. And then when they're both in their you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, they say one of the best things that ever happened to me was getting pregnant or not getting pregnant. Okay, I just read a thing about this a young lady who was doing a graduation speech about abortion. I saw that speech too. And, uh, you know, excellent speech. It was excellent. And, and, but what happens is, I haven't done a reading on a woman who had an abortion that didn't feel that the baby asked her to leave. Think about that. Every one of them, I'd say, did you have a feeling when you were pregnant that this wasn't time and that the baby is saying it wasn't time. And they all say, yes, I did. And nobody has ever talked about that. It's like, you're bad. No, this little spirit knew at a certain time, sometimes it's really young, sometimes it's a little bit older, this is not what I signed up for, this isn't the relationship I want, or this isn't the time for me, or I'm not mature enough to handle this. Think about being in spirit and feeling like I haven't reached that maturity where I can handle being the child of a single mother who's on heroin, okay? And there's so many times that that little spirit is making decisions. And for somebody to say you have to have that child, very difficult. And then you have the reverse, where you have women who want to get pregnant, want to get pregnant, and want to get pregnant, and can't. And what I always say, talk to the spirit. Don't figure out this is a physical thing, it's also a spiritual thing. Get a hold of that little spirit, and it's gonna to want to come through. Right, <laughs> here's Rosalie, here's, you know, all these, all these wonderful beings that come through. So when you think about that, that karma keeps going in your life, but you can't in any way affect somebody else's karma. Now that doesn't mean you can't help people that ask for help, okay? I have known so many people that you know, said they got in the ocean, they were floundering a bit, somebody jumped in to save them and pushed them under and they almost drowned where they were doing just fine on their own. And so you have to sometimes wait for somebody to say, I need a helping hand. And, in, and give that power to people. I think anybody that knows me knows they call me and say, Dottie, I need help, I'm gonna be there. Okay, unless I go, like, I talked to Marie and she was going through something and I said, Marie, I've got the worst headache. We're gonna have to talk later. Okay, why, why, did, why did I do that? I couldn't give her all my attention. I mean, and that's not fair to her. When somebody calls and they want to, help you, to talk to you about something, be able to give them as much attention as they need or want. Because whose karma is being affected? Yours is as a helper. I think many of you have heard me say this. I've said it uh, in church services. If you are on our uh, church services, every Sunday we do virtual church. And one of the things I talk about is I call for at least four people a day to say, hey, how are you doing? And cheer them up. And uh, what I found is almost everybody says, oh, Daddy, I was thinking of you. Or, oh, I really need to, somebody to talk to. Oh, that. So start looking at this. What, how can you help your karma by helping other people? And that karmic connection you have with other people is so important. 
particularly with family. Uh, you know, I'm the eldest of 10 kids, and I've got a couple I don't call because their attitude is so nasty that uh, when I call, I feel drained trying to cheer them up and get them back on the, the road. And what's interesting is uh, one of them that I don't call because of that is a born again Christian. And anytime I call her, she tells me I'm going to hell. You know, and you get tired of that. Uh, you know, I don't believe I'm going to hell, but I get tired of it. And I feel that I'm not going to make her wrong. And I just say, thank you for your concern. Okay, and that, that's what you but I do. I'm not going to argue. I don't argue with people. I, because it's not going to help because they, they have their opinion. So think of that. Sometimes bless them. Say, oh, I'm so glad you found that religion, or I'm so glad you found that cause, or I'm so glad you found that road to take. Because then karmically it's, it's supporting you. And that's one of those things that's very important. When I, when I talk about uh, the, the karmic part of this, realize that each one of you, when you choose who, who <coughs> you come back as, you choose some a type of person that you feel not only is going to work to your best ability, but also you feel that you can uh, further advance the accomplishment, accomplishments. I am tone deaf. I'm so glad I didn't want to be a great opera singer. I, you know, that conflict that would never have worked. But I could have spent years being so, so upset because nobody wanted to hire me to sing. I, I know, I realized at a fairly young age that that wasn't going to be my path. And so you look at what, what is it that is really, what you're really good at. And everybody is good. I, I mean, everybody has something they are good at. And if you haven't found it, it's never too late. Maybe it's doing what I said, calling up people and talking. Uh, maybe it's volunteering. Maybe it's cutting celery at, uh, over at Second Harvest. Whatever makes you feel good is usually what you're good at. And think about what that is. And, uh, and it could be so simple. Okay. Uh, the, the story I share a lot because I just think it was so funny was uh, when I was about eight years old, I lived in Lancaster all by myself with my grandma and everybody else was working in the fields. And I found a piece of wood about this shade. And I'd been given a tennis ball for my birthday. And so I bounced it on the wood. And I bounced it. Oh, I could keep that up. And I, at the end of the summer, I could bounce that ball 850 times. And I declared I was champion of the world. I don't know if anybody else wanted to do it or not, but I was the best. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and what happened? <laughs> well, isn't that fun yeah. for a kid? Can't you just? I used to do that with jacks. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you're the best in the world. It. Yeah, you walk, and, and, and I just always. They came out with the paddle balls oh, the, yeah. on the thing, and I picked one up and went. Oh, when I got into the city and they had assemblies, I used to perform doing two-handed paddle. Little did I know that bouncing a ball on a piece of wood would get me instant fame, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, but the paddles are built differently and the string's not the same. Uh, they've really cheapened it, and it's, it's harder to get it going. I don't have that very well. But that, that ability as a kid to know that you're really good at something. Jacks, marbles. Uh, playing any any game that you, how many of you were good at hopscotch? Jump rope. Anybody here a good yeah. jump rope? Oh, d nice. d being a little fat kid, I really couldn't jump as well as some of the more slender girls. But uh, I thought that was fun. Hopscotch is you know Dottie has story. I get with my nose. Uh, uh, Dottie has stories about everything. When I was working a very wonderful metaphysical place called. Lockheed Missiles in Space, <laughs> yes, um, and uh, we, uh, it was a winter time and all the women who would go out walking, that was their way to get exercise, was to go out and walk, and it was a cold, cold winter. When we had, I don't know how many of you have worked in a building where there's a huge restroom because they used to have to, when they're working with different chemicals, have a place to go wash their hands if they happen to get wet, if they happen to get uh, uh, any kind of solution on them. And this is what this had, and it was a women's restroom, so it had a huge space. And everybody said, oh, I wish I could, I'm not getting any action. So I drove, I went in and I drew a hopscotch. 
You should have heard the women. You could hear them shrieking and yelling and, uh, from the whole building. Hey, there you go, go, yeah, God, oh, you're lighter. Okay, oh, they, you're lighter. And, and the men would walk by and say, what are they doing in there? <laughs> <laughs> and they had more fun playing hopscotch. And somebody said, Donnie, how'd you happen to think about that? I said, because you needed exercise and needed to be inside, and you, you needed community. That's what you were missing was community. And that's what happens in all those past lives that you do, is quite often you're connected with a community in that life. Sometimes that life could be, you were a member of the Nazi party, but that was your community. And the things you did were, you know, were not positive, but what you were looking for was a group to feel wanted and loved and supported. And there's so many of those that we have of these groups that get together and they keep people in the group because they keep telling them what a good job they're doing, whatever it is. And so instead of saying, well, that's horrible, I just say, I bless you and I release your energy. You can bless anybody. You can release their energy so it doesn't bother you, so it doesn't in any way infringe upon who you are. So think about that. When you, th when you hear from somebody who is not the same political party or religion, not even the same gender. I have two young people in my family who have decided they're non-binary. And so it's kind of interesting when you have this, this child that was running around, there was a little girl who was now claiming to be a boy. And because you get tripping over the pronouns, you know, and I, and I'm trying to, but they, them always has mean more than one. So for me, that's kind of difficult. So I just find out what name they're going by and then call them by that name. And that, that seems to work. But there again, that's a choice that they're making. And I don't know what it is, but for them, this is a choice. So I support their choice. Where my, I have one of our family members says, well, that's absolutely the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. And I'm going to call them what they were born as, and I don't care what they want. And you go, OK. But I feel that since your name is William and we call you Bill because you choose that, you've made a choice in your life and families followed through. And it was like, oh, well, yeah, of course they would. That's not the same thing at all. I said, yes, it is. It's honoring people's choice. And that's there again is one of those karmic things you can do is honor, is honor people's choice. Okay? Now, what are we doing time-wise? Um, the other thing that I, I want to talk about is that when you get in touch with a past life, you don't have to love it. You don't have to say, oh, I was, oh, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? You might say, yuck. And, oh, good. Because then you say, I'm not going to judge those pictures. I'm not going to judge those smells. I'm not going to judge me. You are still Annie, Lauren, uh, Kim, uh, Christina. Uh, Marie or, or Luann, you're still that spirit. Remember, spirit is who you are, not body. And your spirit is going to go on. Somebody said, I don't want to go on. This is my last <laughs> life. And I said, wait until you get out of this life before you make that decision. And uh, I've talked to people. I had a dear friend commit suicide last year. And she called me and she said, I've decided I'm going to off myself. And I said, okay, do you want me to talk you out of it? And she said, no, that's why I waited until you were the last one I would call to tell. Because I don't want you to talk me out of it. And I said, okay, what can, you, what can I do? And she said, just don't be too surprised and know that I love you. And I said, okay. And so I got a call from a Lieutenant Marino from New York City saying that my friend had, had died. And that they were convinced it was of natural causes. Yes. So that way, her, ins her insurance was in, fa uh, fact, in effect for some people that really needed some money. But uh, I, you know, and you know, my, my mom said, uh, my mom, <laughs> no, it wasn't my mom. My mom's on the other side. She could have had a voice in this, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, um, one of my, uh, my sisters said, well, that was awful. She had a great life. No, she didn't think she did. There again, we have learned that the, so many books of religion say that that's against. It's still your spirit. You do with your body and your life 
what you choose, not what other people say. When you have any of you ever been in a bad relationship where you felt like you had to do what another person said, or have you ever had that with your parents where you felt like I can't do anything because they won't let me? And for kids, it's horrible because they don't have the wherewithal to be able to leave or to, or to get out on their own. But for other people, when you're adults, you do. You have choice. Yes, being a spiritual being is that you have choice. Okay. Um, I, I just do you want to hear a couple more past lives or are you to get tired of? Is that okay? Uh, the reason I say that is because uh, I talked about uh, when I was in um, Los Angeles and I died, and I talked about I was born in '38. Well, uh, there was a lifetime that I had that I was very, very young, and I was 16 when I got pregnant, and I was living in Mississippi, and uh, my and I, my name was Shanti, and I got pregnant by a young man named Bo, and he was a saxophone player, and my father was very Irish. My mother and father came over during the plague in Ireland, and I had settled there. Why Mississippi? I don't know. But anyway, I was very fair and very thin, and uh, I was very, very abused by my, uh, my father. Uh, I can remember, remember in that past life, um, when I started my period, I said I needed to get something, some Kotex, and he said, no, you don't. That's a waste of money. You just throw them away. You're going to use rags like your mother and your grandmother did. And I can remember washing out these bloody rags and hanging them on the line and hoping nobody would see them because I was just 14. And, and the, the, the sheer horror if somebody saw them, you know, that they'd know what I was doing. And, uh, but so anyway, at 16 I got pregnant and uh, my father kicked me out. And so I was 16, no place to go. Don't, I don't just have a bare minimum of high school. And uh, Bo, I told Bo, and he said, we're, we're going to leave. And I had been living in the barn. And so he came by, and he had a car, a little old truck. And he said, come on, I'm gonna, I've got my saxophone, and we're going to go into the big city, which was St. Louis. And I'm going to play, and we're going to make lots of money. And I'm going to be a musician. So we got to St. Louis, and there was this big Victorian. Imagine, I, I, I can, it was a Victorian then, and it was a Victorian uh, when uh, I got there. And it rented to all black musicians. Mm -hmm. And here my, my, we were these, I was this white Irish gal, and there my, and my, my boy, boyfriend was this just typical redneck from Mississippi. And we moved in, and there was a gal down, down, the, down the row in the, the house. They rented out the rooms. I mean, we didn't have an apartment. We had a room for rent. And uh, uh, we were there, and her name was Ruby. And Ruby said, oh, girl, you're pregnant. Oh, I love babies. And she just took me, and then she was this big, stereotypical little black woman. And she just wrapped me in her arms and said, oh, this is going to be so fun having a baby. And so my, my baby was Bo Jr. And when he was about three months old, I get a call in the phone out in the hall. And I pick it up and it's Bo and he said, Shanti, come down here, come down here, come down here, bring my saxophone. I've got a gig and if we get this gig, I, you know, right, right then he was washing dishes. If we get this gig, we're, we're, our lives are gonna move. And I said, okay. So I remember it was cold and I had this really thin coat and I was wearing heels, because everybody wore high heels then. And I'm running down, and I'm so excited, and I put my hand in my pocket to get the two dimes to get on the elevated train to go to, to Bo with the saxophone. And I put my hand in my pocket, and the key is in there, and I have locked the baby in the room. And I stopped, and I remember the wind was cold. I could hear the elevated train going beep, beep, beep. Uh, my heart was in my throat because I needed to get to Bo. Uh, and I had the saxophone, and I, I'm standing there, and I turn around, and I look, and I can see flames coming out of where I lived. And just then I hear, oh, and this horse drawn fire engine went by with it, and, and I ran. And as I got to the, the building, 
It was completely engulfed in flame, and I ran in. And every time I talk about that, I kind of go, whoa, you know. But the thing that was so interesting is I told Mom about that past life, and she said, oh, Dottie, well, during the 40s, well, you would sit in front of our big Philco radio, and every time a saxophone player played, you cried. See, it still gets to me, you know, because it was such a moving thing of how do you think, what do I do to help my husband get ahead, what do I do? And I've locked my baby in, you know, and so for years I didn't have a single door in my house that locked, including the front door. And he remembers, uh, I it took a, a boat of my whole family to, let, to put locks on the bathroom door. I was so convinced that something was going to happen if we had locks on the doors. So that's what that lifetime did for me. And, and Earl Bostick was a very well-known saxophone player that I used to sit and listen to over and over again on, the, on vinyl. Uh, it was just amazing. And so that was one of those that put me in a place of accepting love from other people when my parents couldn't give it to me. The interesting thing is I thought my name was Shanti, but it was with Shanti for Shanti Irish. I had never heard in this incarnation that the Shanty Irish was this scorn that you call somebody from Ireland when they came over during the potato famine. And um, so, and that I had heard it so much and people calling me Shanty that I decided that was my name. Oh. So that was kind of one of those really interesting things. And Bo, I don't know where the name Bo came from. Right. But when you, uh, the emotion I have about that lifetime has carried on into things I do in this lifetime, like loving music, even though I'm not really good at singing. I love listening to music, and especially in the horns, horn section. If I say, oh, that's a great music, you know it's got a big horn section. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to put you into a past life. Okay. Have some water. We have some fresh fruit back there. If you'd like some, the blue land brought. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, you can ask me anytime you want to. Anybody have any questions? I know it's easy for me. Since I've had so many oh, yeah, past yeah. lives, it's easy for me to take over the, the, the whole thing. Yes? What were you going to say, Lynn? No. <laughs> when you mentioned, when you were talking about the smells, you were talking about a guy. Like, what about doing the rosette? Like, what about the brushing on with helping that guy brought you to the smells? No, that was when I was, um, when I was Kalpa. Uh, I can remember that but, smell. But before you, before you went into that life, you were saying that you were helping somebody, and then all of a sudden you had those smells, like you were talking to someone? Hmm. I don't remember. You see what happens? Yeah, you got to catch it quick when you're my age. Uh, no, uh, no I, uh, Kalpa is the one that I remember the smell, because it always reminded me of, you know, evil. And I can equate that smell with other things. I don't remember what it was that I mentioned the smell before. Are you, are you yeah. freezing to death, Kim? Not freezing, but I'm cold. I was trying to get you. I was walk away from the same thing. Because it's like hot <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I've experienced, you know, I mean, you know, I've experienced a couple, you know, mm -hmm. like the first time we went to Kauai. Mm -hmm. That was really interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I always wonder, and I, you know, when I, I my spirit guide says it's true. But the reason why I couldn't sit through a history class when they were talking about World War II, and they would show mm -hmm. the the Jews in the pits and you know the skeletons, and I could not, I would pass out. And there's only been two books that I've ever been able to read about World War II. One is Anne Frank's diary, and mm -hmm. the other is Until We Meet Again, written by Jan's brother. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. it. That's it. Yeah, we have a dear friend who's. <coughs> brother-in-law wrote a book, Till We Meet Again, it's about his grand, his parents. Uh, and they had uh, they were teenagers during the Second World War. Yep. And uh, it's an excellent book because right. it talks about what happened. But it's interesting that you know, Debbie used to say to me, Hello. are you sure you work here, Frank? You look a little like her in this life. The wind is getting very chilly. Oh. Courtney's going darn, do I have to turn? Um, I'm going to in this and then we'll okay.